All right, guys, welcome back. What we're going to talk about first is FDR's four freedoms. Now, I'm going to pull these up for you. Uh, perhaps no one's made a better case for American internationalism in the days before the U.S. entered the war than President Roosevelt himself in a famous speech. He said the four freedoms. FDR recently had been elected to an unprecedented third term and wanted to impress the American people, many of whom still opposed U.S. involvement in definitely the war with Europe. And, and as we know, the president was aiding Britain really kind of under, underhandedly and now was standing alone against Germany, not only ensured their security, but to protect all the people's freedom uh, anywhere, especially in Europe. So FDR gave this speech in 1941 as a State of the Union address. And I want you to take in some of the things he said right here. So I want you to look at he said this, in the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. First is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. So I think we can all agree with that. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his way everywhere in the world. Third is the freedom from want, which translates into world terms means economic understanding, which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. And next is freedom from fear, which translates into a world term, means a worldwide reduction of armaments, such as such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. Now, I think that all of these are, are very forthright. I mean, it, it puts out exactly what he believed. And let's take into account for a second, as, as Americans, we still hold true to many of these. In fact, you could see where he pulled these out straight out of our Constitution. The thing you've got to think about, though, is our Constitution is for American citizens. What FDR did is he took our, our own wants and our own needs to have those securities and put them on other people in Europe in essence, turning them into Americans so that we would see them as the same as us, rather than just saying we are some certain people and they are certain people. Instead of an independent country, we are now a, a world country. Now, because of that, we also have something called selective services, because no matter what you do, you have to have manpower. And not everyone wants to sacrifice their lives. So President Roosevelt... He had originally made a promise that the young boys aren't going to be sent to any foreign wars. However, he also recognized the need to have a stronger military service. So to that end, Congress passed what they called the Selective Service and Training Act of 1940. It was commonly just referred to as Selective Service Act, and it was the first peacetime draft. So we've had multiple drafts from the beginning of our country. But this was one of the first ones that happened during a time of peace. Uh, the law required that all males aged 21 to 35 had to register for this. And it was a lottery system basically requiring uh, help for draftees for duty. If you were selected, the act required a man to serve for 12 months, after which he would be discharged. All services had to occur in the mainland U.S. or in U.S. possessions. The act also limited peacetime armies to a maximum of 900,000 men. So we couldn't build up an army that's too big. It also allowed for non-combat duty for uh, consciousness objectors. So if, if you did not agree with the war, then there were still jobs for you to have. You just didn't have to fight. And by the summer of 1941, it had become increasingly evident that the U.S. was about to enter into the war. By one single vote, Congress extended the act's term of service from 12 to 18 months. And Congress passed a new Selective Service Act soon after the U.S. joined the war, which required all men age 18 to 65 to register for the draft. And anyone 18 to 45, they were eligible for military service. This uh, new act, obviously, lengthened the term of service to six months, after, um, by the end of the war, and from 1940 until 1947, which was when the wartime draft law expired, more than 10 million Americans had, 10 million Americans actually been inducted into this military service. So we go from a country where we have no draft 
to people being drafted preemptively to going into war, drafting even more people, and then expanding the age of people willing to fight. So we went from 21 to 35 to 18 to 65. All right, let's talk about Pearl Harbor for a second. The Americans were hoping of staying out of this war, but once Japan attacked the naval base, Pearl Harbor at Hawaii, it was, it was positive we were going to be in the war, especially when we had 2,400 Americans killed. It also temporarily crippled our Pacific fleet. The USS Arizona was destroyed by an armor-piercing bomb that detonated in the ship's fuel and ammunition chain. Uh, more than 1,100 sailors and Marines died on board that ship alone. Other Japanese planes were heavily damaging Pearl Harbor's army installations and airfields at the same time, but we recovered. However, this changed the view on the war. Americans were more willing to sacrifice money and basically sacrifice anything they could, their own lives, in order to protect the country. Now I want to talk about really the intent. Now the Japanese did not intend on knocking out the US power completely. Okay? Uh, they knew they knew this was not going to completely destroy them, but they had designed it to be a, a really strong blow against them. Members of the Japanese high command felt that they could deliver this crippling blow uh, and the US would not have the heart to prolong a war. However, the Japanese obviously underestimated the United States' ability to make war and its economic capabilities. So in order to avoid detection, the Japanese fleet used a uh, difficult nor uh, northern rather than eastern route as they normally would to attack, uh, to attack Pearl Harbor. And many of the United States military officials uh, thought Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was impossible. Uh, first, due to the distance from Japan to Hawaii, and second, because it was very shallow harbor. So they knew if the planes were to drop uh, torpedoes into the water, they would more likely impact on the harbor floor rather than hitting the ships. Most Americans believed that the Japanese had planned a sneak attack, is how they originally thought. But in actuality, the Japanese plan did not call for an attack first and a declaration of hostilities later, the translation of a diplomatic cable to the United States government was delayed, and by the time the Japanese ambassador could deliver the cable, the attack had already begun. So what happened is, the Japanese sent a message saying, we're going to attack you. By the time they received the message that said we're going to attack you, they had already been attacking us. You can make your own opinion. My personal opinion is it doesn't matter whether you declare you're going to attack them or attack them. It's the same difference. You attacked them. So with that said, Think of it as these two countries, one really saying we're going to attack you and we're going to keep you out of our war by showing you how strong we are. But instead, it actually drew America into the war even faster. It did the exact opposite of what the Japanese wanted it to do. All right, let's cover FDR's response. Now, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt addressed a joint session of Congress and asked for a declaration of war against Japan. He opened his speech with the famous words of this, yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. FDR also described the attack as dastardly and unprovoked. The Senate voted unanimously to declare war on Japan. Only one member of the House of Representatives voted against it. He's the only one in World War I or World War II to vote against it. His name was Janae Rankin of Montana. FDR did not ask Congress to declare war against Germany, however. Both Germany and Italy declared war against the United States. So America now found itself fighting against two fronts. We now had Germany and Italy against us, and Japan against us. All right, I want to talk to you a little about German agents in the United States. So in June of 1942, authorities captured four German agents, apparently delivered to the United States shoreline by submarine. Soon after they had landed in Long Island, New York, a few days later, the authorities snapped up four more agents near Jacksonville, Florida. In both instances, the agents carried explosives, maps, several thousand dollars in cash. According to the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, the agents, now think about that name, Hoover, we'll come back to that a little bit later. The agents had landed with the goal of a two-year campaign of sabotage against United States war industries, railways, waterworks, and bridges. In the Long Island case, the Coast Guard personally observed the initial landing. 
but lacked the equipment to deal with a landing party. Instead, they notified the FBI, which conducted surveillance in the area and eventually found and arrested the enemy agents. The FBI arrested the Florida group shortly thereafter as well. The Coast Guard and FBI criticized each other for their handling of the landings. As a result, shore patrols and surveillances were increased for the duration of the war. What I want you to realize out of this is not just the repercussions of these people landing and changing how our coastline was being guarded, the repercussions of how Americans began to view Germans and view American Japanese, people who lived in America maybe their whole life, their parents are German, their parents are Japanese, and all of a sudden now people are starting to look over their shoulder and say, can we trust this person? Can we trust that person? And it's beginning to change how Americans view each other. Now, German submarines, also called undersea boots or U-boats as we call them, they were patrolling off the east coast of the United States in the days after Pearl Harbor, found the coastline essentially unguarded. In addition to most shipping in the region traveled with lights on and unescorted, they, they were considered easy prey for a German U-boat. So you had ships going down, there were no guards, and they had lights on them so you could see them, mostly so they didn't run into each other at night. But to the Germans, these were easy targets. The German Navy instituted Operation Pockenschlag, or drumbeat, in which German U-boats, or wolf packs as they were called, sank ships with impunity in what they called the American shooting season. So in 10 days, five U-boats sank 25 ships without a single U-boat sunk or damaged. The United States shipping losses skyrocketed through the first part of 1942. More and more U-boats appeared in the waters on the Western Atlantic, and at one point, 105 U-boats were patrolling the U.S. coast, sinking 524 ships along uh, with nearly 8 million tons of shipping, 8 million tons of goods. This increased patrols uh, by the U.S. Navy 10th Fleet managed to strike back against the U-boats. Given the mission of finding, tracking, and destroying Ger German submarines, the fleet sank 65 of these U-boats in late 1942 and, nearly, and in early 1944. It eventually sank more than 100, um, and eventually the Germans' high command judges lo uh, judged losses in the western Atlantic too high and pulled the remaining U-boats from the area, reassigning them to the northern Atlantic. So think about that. These, within just a number of days, five boats had sunk uh, 25 ships. And overall, they had sunk, sunk hundreds and hundreds of boats leaving America. And these boats were needed for goods. They had soldiers on them. They had equipment on them. And these U-boats were just taking them out one at a time. Now, these right here, the Japanese balloon bombs. I'm going to end with this today. These are really cool. As far as a death machine can be cool... The Japanese had to think of some special way of getting bombs all the way from Japan to America. So while the Japanese and Germans couldn't launch a direct assault like we have missiles today, they did try to attack the mainland. So they used these balloon bombs. The construction was mostly of paper and rubberized silk. The balloons carried uh, both anti-personnel and incendiary bombs. The Japanese launched more than 9,000 balloons towards the United States uh, though only about a thousand made it, and less than 300 sightings were actually reported. The U.S. military and news media elected not to provide widespread coverage of these balloons, while the Japanese decided to end the offensive by April 1945, uh, certain that their operation had failed. So these balloons, they were all covered in sandbags, and the balloons would lift up, but as the balloons go, they would lose... Uh, the gases out of it, the, uh, the hydrogen or helium that they were using to fill them up. And as the balloon began to decrease in its height, they had a timer set, a, an actual digital timer like a clock that would drop the sandbags and the weights, allowing them to go back up. And they calculated how far they would have to travel in order to make it to America. So in May of 1945, after the war was over, a balloon bomb killed six Oregon picnickers uh, when it exploded as they dragged it from the woods. The federal government then publicized the balloon bombs, warning people not to tamper with them. The Oregon deaths were the only known civilian home front fatalities during the entire World War II. So I know we lost a lot of people in, Hawaii, in, um, in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, but as the uh, 
as far as the home front goes from California all the way over to New York, the only people that were lost were these six people. It was a, a mom and her five children were lost. And the father, the last thing he heard was his wife and kids calling him over that they found something out in the woods. Then there was an explosion that killed all of them as they were around this bomb. It's at that point that the government decided we need to make sure that Americans are aware that there could be dangers around us. And we're going to cover civil defense next time, and this is it for today. So I'll see you tomorrow in class.